good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our workshop. My name is Hannah. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a freshman at WashU. And I have a few housekeeping notes before we begin. So this is workshop number 29, Environmental Racism in St. Louis, What Comes Next. This is a one-hour workshop, so we'll conclude at 11.30 a.m. If you're looking for a different workshop, now is your chance to relocate. Um, before we begin, I wanted to walk through a few items, both for the people in this room as well as for our attendees joining, vir joining virtually via Zoom through the Whova app. If you're joining us online, please keep your microphone off until ready to ask a question. I'll be monitoring the chat. There are a few ways to interact during this session on Whova. If you look on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see several tabs. These include Q&A, which is a chance to submit questions to the presenters, polls, chat, and the community tab, which allows you to interact with the full audience of attendees at the summit. Also, a recording of this workshop will be made available in the next few days on the Whova app. All of the content from the summit will be available on the app for the next few months. Make sure when you're entering a question or remark that you're in the proper area. I'll be monitoring the chat and Q&A sections of the app and help field questions for the speakers. With that, let me introduce today's presenters. Tara Roque is an assistant professor of practice at the Washington University School of Law. Liz Huberts is the director of the Interdisciplinary Environmental Clinic at the WashU School of Law and the professor of practice. Hey. Um, hi, as you said, I am Tara Roque, and I'm the assistant director of the Interdisciplinary Environmental Clinic, and I'm here with my director, Liz Huberts, who today gets to be my assistant. Can you use the microphone, please? Can you hear me? Okay. No, can I hear you? Will do. I'm not good at standing, sitting and talking. Apologies. Um, so what we are at the Interdisciplinary Environmental Clinic is we are, frankly, what I think is an awesome organization. We're housed within the law school, but we accept students from all over the university. And we, um, under the guidance of both lawyer professors and science-based professors, represent individuals, low-income individuals, and nonprofit organizations um, on real-life cases. We're in courts. We're before regulatory agencies. We're doing policy assessments. And we really work to make our region a better place. Um, today we're talking about our work on environmental racism in St. Louis. First, I want to talk to you just briefly how today is going to go. First, I'm going to give you a brief recap of the findings from our initial environmental racism report. Um, then I'm going to give you, given the limited time, as detailed a summary as I can of the recommendations that we have since come up with. Um, then I'm going to break out, well, I'm going to have you use these dots to go over there to that, those um, posters and put dots next to the recommendations that you think would have the most effect on the disparities that we are going to discuss today and also those that will um, be achievable because frankly, pie in the sky ideas are not good for anything. Then I'm gonna break out into four groups that four groups based on those four topics over there. And I want you to have internal discussion, talking about pros, cons, potential pitfalls, and importantly, ways to make this a reality. During those discussions, I want you to make use of the notebooks that I have spread about on all of your tables. I want you to take really, really, really good notes because I want to steal them. I don't want you to take them with you. I want you to leave them for me because we only have an hour and we have a bunch of beautiful brains in this room and I want to steal all of your ideas. I want to make these recommendations as good as I can. And importantly, if you are interested after this in talking with us more, collaborating with us, grabbing a cup of coffee, whatever you want, put your contact information on those notebooks because we'll reach out to you. Um, and if you don't want us to reach out to you, don't give us your contact information. Um, and then we'll have a group discussion with each group sharing their thoughts at the end. So that's how today is going to go. Let's start talking about the envir environmental racism report. This report was published in 2019. Um, how it began was four local environmental justice or environmental and environmental justice related groups in St. Louis 
Action St. Louis, Arch City Defenders, Dutchtown South Community Corporation, and the Missouri chapter of the Sierra Club reached out to our clinic and asked that we look at environmental justice issues in the city. And frankly, no one had done a comprehensive analysis of environmental racism in St. Louis before we put this report together. And we focused on eight environmental justice indicators that the organizations that we worked with told us were of most priority. And we found time after time that the disparities were statistically significant and prevalent. I'm gonna briefly go through our findings. The first was related to lead. 90% of the homes in St. Louis were built before lead paint was banned in 1978. We all drink water coming from the same pipes. So you would think that all of us suffer from generally the same rate of lead exposure, but that's not the case. Black children are 2.4 times more likely to test positive for lead in St. Louis, and they account for 70% of all lead poisoning in St. Louis. With respect to asthma, Again, you'd think that the air is the air we're all breathing, but no. Black children make 10 times more ER visits for asthma every year compared to white children. If you think of that in numbers, for every 1,000 black children, every year 42 of them is gonna end up in the ER for asthma. With white children, it's four in 1,000. Air pollution. This is an area where we have insufficient data to make hard conclusions, hence the increased data collection uh, sheet over there. But we do know that there are significantly more air pollution permits granted in majority black neighborhoods, and there are more demolitions in majority black neighborhoods. And frankly, I find it highly unlikely that these asthma disparities are coming out of nowhere. Mold, this is another area we have very little data, but we do know that mold complaints in the city are much more significant and much more common in majority black neighborhoods compared to white neighborhoods, majority white neighborhoods. With respect to energy burdens, and if anyone doesn't know what that is, that's the percentage of household income spent on energy costs. Black St. Louis households spend significantly more of their income on energy costs, twice that of the, of the citywide median. 7.4% for black residents and the city, the city median is only 4%. Of the 48 major cities in the United <coughs> States, St. Louis places the sixth highest energy burden on black households. Food apartheid, which is another way of saying food deserts. Black residents are twice as likely to have limited access to healthy foods to live, as, live in areas designated as food deserts compared to white residents. And they are also at the same time statistically less likely to have vehicle access. That is a bad combination for access to healthy foods. Illegal dumping. A vast majority of illegal dumping occurs in majority black neighborhoods. I'm not talking about someone throwing a soda can out their window. I'm talking about truckloads of used tires, demolition waste, construction waste, dumped in our streets, in our alleys, in our lots, and even in people's yards. And to put that in perspective, in 2017, 22,000 tons of waste were illegally dumped in our streets and alleys. The city does not maintain data on how much was dumped in lots and in yards, so that, that figure is low. Vacancy. Vacancy is a major issue for this city. St. Louis suffers from what's called hyper-vacancy. And more than 90% of all vacant properties, 90% are located in majority black neighborhoods. For, yes? Do you mind if we, if we admit that person it's on the screen? Do you mind if I... Oh, sure. I'm sorry. I don't know how to do that. Thank you very much. Oh, please. Sorry, I didn't even see it, but I'll, I'll sit and watch. The Thank you. I think it comes up over there. Too. Okay. Um, and with respect to vacancy, some neighborhoods in this city have vacancy rates of 50% or even 60%. This is a significant problem. All of these are significant problems that are currently and constantly being disproportionately perpetuated on black St. Louis residents. 
are the vacancies households or industrial properties or just or in general? It's a mixture. Um, I would have to look at the stats. It's available yeah. on the Vacancy Explorer website that um, legal services in the city put together. That breaks down vacancy rates by who owns it, commercial, residential, vacant properties versus vacant lots. Vacancy Explorer is a fantastic resource. Thanks. So that leads us to our recommendations. What we did um, after putting out the report, examining what was found, what the data was, what the disparities were, that only identifies the problem. That does nothing to reduce these disparities and ultimately solve the problem. So we have spent the last two years examining the laws and po well, determining what laws and policies are at the heart, are at the root of these disparities. Um, seeing what the laws and policies are elsewhere, seeing how other cities, states, and even countries have attacked these issues successfully, and then thinking what would and could work in this city. And these are the preliminary results of our findings. Now, I have today a very brief summary given, given time limitations. I spread around, and um, Ashton is also going to share in the chat a link to a more detailed result. It's not that. It's, the piece, it's just a piece of paper. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not that fancy. I didn't, I didn't do pamphlets. And, um, and so that has more detail, but the full report is not going to be released until it has been discussed and vetted with affected communities because frankly, the people that are suffering from this are best positioned to tell us what should be prioritized, what is wanted, and honestly, what is unwanted. So this is a, my attempt to improve what we have before we bring it to the community. So um, these recommendations, they run the gamut. Some talk about changes to laws that are on the books. Others look to change the governmental priorities and spending decisions. And still others are areas where academics and nonprofits can step in to make a difference. All right, so let's begin with the first topic, which is conditions affecting the home, which we have up right now. Many of, I know conditions inside the home are not normally considered an environmental issue, but many of the environmental burdens felt within the city of St. Louis stem within triggers found in the home, and particularly with respect to landlord-tenant housing. These are issues such as mold, <coughs> asthma, high energy costs, and lead exposure. Um, when you look at landlord-tenant housing, there's also often an incentive vacuum to fix a problem. Landlords have the incentive of keeping costs low and profits high. Tenants are often unwilling or unable to make capital expenditures on property that does not belong to them. Mm -hmm. This, the recommendations that we put together seeks to reduce an, the effect of this incentive vacuum and in some cases make the vacuum disappear. The first is a relatively simple solution that I think would go far. Disclosure requirements for energy costs and mold. Right now, a landlord does not need to tell a tenant what they are walking into, whether an apartment is filled with mold, whether they're going to be paying $600 a month in utility costs come December. These are surprises to tenants after they move in and are roped into a one-year lease. If landlords were required to disclose known mold contamination, to give tenants with the past 12 months of energy bills for the property, tenants would be able to make informed decisions as to whether or not they actually want to rent that apartment, and landlords would have a real incentive to fix it. Because I don't know anyone who can move into an apartment knowing they're going to be paying $600 a month come December. Um, this would reduce disparities with respect to mold, respect to energy burdens, asthma, and improve issues with air pollution from over energy. <coughs> Energy assistance programs are present for people in need. There's the low income energy assistance and the low income weatherization program. They're known by their acronyms LIHEAP and LIWAP. These programs provide much needed assistance, both for helping people with their energy, their energy bills and weatherizing property and improving energy efficiency 
so those energy bills go down long term. However, um, these programs do not reach enough people. The income caps are too low to, uh, to really account for the realities of what it costs to live in today's society. LIWAP in particular is incredibly difficult to apply for. Many people are unaware of these benefits due to insufficient outreach. And unfortunately, there's little coordination in the way these programs are administered and applied for, making it difficult for citizens to apply and leading to overspending and inefficiencies in government. We recommend that these deficiencies be remediated to make sure that these important programs are actually available to the folks that need it. Improving LIHEAP would reduce energy burdens. I think LIWAP is really the most important here, um, in the long term at least, because it's not just a stopgap measure, but it would make people's homes more energy efficient and reduce costs in the long term, um, while thereby not only reducing energy burden, but also reducing asthma rates and air pollution. Moving on to the occupancy and building codes. St. Louis's building and occupancy codes do not list mold or dampness as a code violation. What that means is a tenant can call an inspector, say, my house is making my child sick. The inspector walks in, see a wall covered with mold, a wheezing child, and can't do boo about it. The tenant cannot get out of their lease without risking financial and legal harm. Their kid is sick and nothing can be done. If, if the were, these were code violations, our inspectors could enforce them. I think they should be added to the code. Um, this would help, obviously, with respect to mold, but also with our asthma rates. Going back to disclosure-related issues, unlike mold and energy costs, lead is required to be disclosed to prospective tenants by federal law but there is no requirement for testing. This means that landlords have an incentive to remain purposefully ignorant as to the existence in lead, in their paint, in the water, in the soil, because once they know it exists, they have to tell people about it. And that means if they want tenants in their pro property, they need to fix it. Lead is too important to allow for the whims of landlords to have interests different from the folks that are actually living in these properties. We recommend that these disclosure requirements be coupled with periodic testing requirements. Not every year, but maybe once every 10 years, a landlord has to go in and do a comprehensive testing of their property to assess lead safety. That way, these disclosure requirements are actually meaningful. And last, I want to talk about our landlord-tenant laws. Missouri's landlord-tenant laws are notoriously landlord-friendly. We have an implied warranty of habitability that's present in almost every state. And the implied warranty of habitability essentially says when you're renting an apartment, it comes with an implied promise that you can actually live in it, that it won't be raining on you as you sleep through the ceiling. But Oh, oh, sorry. But unlike many other states, Missouri's is not created by statute. It is a judge-made doctrine. That means there are procedures you need to follow in order to bring a suit. What is habitable and what is not habitable varies widely depending on what judge you're in front of. Tenants do not know what they are supposed to have done until it is too late. These standards need to be spelled out in statute so tenants have the actual ability to enforce their right or to push for their right for healthy housing. Missouri does have a rent and repair statute that says a tenant can make repairs and then withhold that money from rent. There are a number of problems with that that are outlined in the sheet that I gave you. One which I want to point out here is that the amount is limited to $300 in any 12-month period. Sorry, the less, the, the greater of, lesser of, greater of, $300 or half of one month's rent in any 12-month period. That is not enough to make any substantive health-based changes. This law should be rewritten, this and the warranty of habitability, in order to provide tenants with legitimate legal avenues to support their right to safe housing.
housing. Moving on to our next topic, data. It wouldn't be an, an academic conference if we did not talk about data. And there are several areas where we could use, desperately need more of it. So um, starting with asthma. Missouri, the state of Missouri has a lovely website where they talk about asthma issues, but they, that data stops at 2014. The policies the standards, everything that the state is doing in relation to asthma is based on a decade old data. If Missouri wants to craft policies that recognize the circumstances that we are faced with today, they need to gather, use, and share updated data so that our laws, our regulations make sense. For mold, there is no data available on mold in the city of St. Louis. In order for the clinic to make its determination, we had to go to the Citizen Service Bureau, which is the city bureau where people put in complaints, review all of them <laughs> and see who, who called in mold complaints. And that was our only source of data. That is not the best basis for an analysis. We used what was available to us, but we need something better. We need to know how many people are being affected to what extent and where in order to craft efficient policies in order to reduce these disparities. Air pollution. Officially, the city of St. Louis has only three functioning air monitors in the city. I believe there are 28 set up, but only three of them actually work. And two of them are directly across the street from each other. <laughs> This means that our governmental agencies do not know who is breathing what, where. We, were, we do know, like I said, where air pollution permits are granted. We do, not, we do know where highways are, but we don't know the effects. We don't know what's actually happening to the air around us. Now, WashU professor Jay Turner is doing a great job to alleviate that, he's putting mobile, they're using mobile air monitors, they're putting air monitors on houses of worship. But this is privately collected data, and I think we all know that private data is treated differently than government data. I want to see real, effective, and meaningful air pollution data being collected and used by our government to craft policies to determine whether permits should be granted and to make changes so we know what is going on and who is breathing what. Can I just ask a real quick question related to that? So the three that are functioning, who's overseeing those? Um, I believe they are EPA monitors. Yes, yes. The DNR, the DNR, the DNR okay. monitors. <clears throat> um, they'd be DNR monitors yeah. along with. Is there any sort of testing for radon gas in older basements? <laughs> I was going to mention that too. I know when I bought my house, I had it tested and it had a radon problem, but I don't know about that. Yeah, but you're doing that. There's a requirement above and because you're educated and know, you know, like it should probably be considered. I, I, I have not looked into that. When I met with EPA, they said that it would be hard to detect uh, what was in a home because people use Lysol and perfumes and stuff, and that's it would pick up, um, if they were to put monitors inside a home, it would pick all of those um, other chemicals. Yeah, I think those monitors are just in the basement. So, you know, wait, we're going to have group discussion later. I want to focus us back here. Um, there, so the handouts, Ashton is going to share. I thought you would all have access to it when I uploaded it. Ashton's going to share a link in the chat for Hoover so you can have it online. It should be on there now. It's either from me or Hannah. Uh, there's two links. Um, so, okay, so that's air pollution and illegal dumping. Now, the sanitation department for the city of St. Louis does collect data on where pollution occurs and so, excuse me, where illegal dumping occurs and to what extent. But to our knowledge, that data is only used by the sanitation department. Illegal dumping cannot be effectively addressed with just cleaning up after it. You need some sort of deterrent, whether it be greening, fencing, doing something to make areas inaccessible to dumpers. This data needs to be shared outside of the sanitation department and used in a comprehensive effort to really address illegal dumping in this city. 
22,000 tons as a low estimate is way too much for a city to handle. Okay, moving on to the built environment. And unfortunately, you can't see that top thing, but I'll be saying enough of it out loud for you. To Apologies in advance. We were very loosey-goosey with this sort of um, category. It is very hard to break down environmental justice issues and recommendations in the category. So, apologies. But starting with the built environment, we have two air pollution related recommendations. The first relates to power plants. St. Louis is ringed by four coal fired power plants, and the effect shows in our air pollution levels and in our asthma rates. Unfortunately, our state and federal government agencies do not enforce the regulations on the books. These these power plants, they pollute our air, they pollute our water with impunity. For instance, in Labadee, Missouri, not too far from here, <laughs> is the largest power plant in the United States without, um, air, without air pollution controls on its stacks. I think it's frankly one of the deadliest power plants in the United States, according to recent research. So, were these, an, without effective government action, you're left with citizen suits. Regular people to take on behemoths that are earning a billion dollars a year in order to try to enforce environmental regulations. People don't have the resources available to do this. You can't take on someone that can hire every, every attorney, every, every knowledgeable attorney in the state, every expert in the state. You need government to take on entities like this, and government needs to step up and do it. Were these regulations properly enforced and power plants were required to actually internalize the, the costs of their operations, meaning pollution and the control thereof, they would be left with two choices. Install effective pollution controls or find a cleaner source of energy that does not result in that air pollution. I would vote for the latter, but either way, or both, but either way, we would all be the safer for it. We need effective and in, we need effective enforcement. The laws are there for a reason. Moving on to our second air pollution topic. Of course, we all know um, structure for electric vehicles and incentives for um, renewable energy. It goes without saying how much this would do to improve our air quality and to reduce asthma. Right now in the Midwest, I have an electric vehicle and it is practically impossible for me to engage in long distance travel because there is no infrastructure. I can't charge. So I have to have us, we have to have a second car that's gas if we want to go on a road trip. You cannot have effective electric, you cannot have an effective rollout of electric vehicles without a method to power them. Um, moving on to vacancy. As I said, this is a major problem for the city. This is such a major problem that I feel safe saying that St. Louis will not thrive unless this is addressed. Some ideas that we have. As a result of the high vacancy rates, the city's land bank called the Land Reutilization Authority owns thousands upon thousands of vacant lots and buildings. Right now, they're sitting on these properties largely, spending money to maintain them. I would like to see these properties opened up for purchase and private development, but you can't just open it up without teeth. What you need to do is focus these efforts on resident people who want to build houses or improve houses and include requirements where people need to develop real plans, get permits in order to make these plans a reality, and have clawbacks with um, foreclosure requirements or penalties if people don't live, it up, live up to it. We don't want more major developers buying up large swaths of North City and then leaving them, like we have seen in the past. Vacant properties are often nuisances violating codes, diminishing property values, inviting crime and illegal dumping, and causing health risks as they deter deteriorate. That is because our building department is overwhelmed with the amount of vacant properties in this city. 
We need strategic code enforcement. I have some concerns about it, but I, that I'd like you all to discuss. But we need strategic code enforcement to ensure that these vacant properties do not deteriorate into nuisance properties. Um, because as they deteriorate, what it does is these toxins break into the air and they, we breathe it. We breathe the mold. We breathe the lead. We breathe the asbestos. We don't want that to happen. So that leads us to demolitions. The properties deteriorate further and further until they become unsafe. Then the property can no longer be saved. It needs to be demolished. We have safe demolition um, laws on the books in St. Louis, but those laws are insufficiently enforced. So when buildings are demolished without safe building practices, such as wedding and other actions, not some, but all of those toxins go out into the air. <coughs> um, it goes into the air, it goes into the soil, it poisons neighbors. What I would like to see is inspectors doing a drive-by of every demolition in progress. And I wanna see hefty penalties assessed against people that conduct demolitions with, without following the law. And not only that, I would like to see them pay the cost of making the neighborhood safer around them that they poisoned. It's not enough just to say bad boy, they should have, or girl, they should have to clean up what they did. Um, so, not all, so all of these efforts that I've discussed with vacancy, not only will it address the vacancy problem, but because that is so inexorably tied to all the other issues we address in St. Louis, it would reduce illegal dumping. It would improve air quality. It would reduce lead exposure. It would stem the spread of food deserts. And hopefully, while not an environmental justice issue, it is a justice issue. It would have a positive effect with regard to the lost generational wealth that has been suffered by black St. Louisans as property values in majority black neighborhoods decline, decline, <coughs> decline. I'm sure we all know the major source of household wealth is usually the home. And when that home declines in value, significantly declines in value, it, it's very problematic. Um, green spaces. So moving on from vacancy to green spaces, I'm taking up too much time, I apologize. St. Louis has done a really, has not done a really good job of creating and maintaining green spaces in our majority black neighborhoods. We recommend that this be rectified with targeted greening area efforts on the areas that most need it. This can be accomplished a whole host of ways. Improve the quality of parks that already exist. Plant some trees, install hedges along busy streets to trap some of those toxins that are coming off from the cars. Take, all, take some of those city-owned vacant lots and convert them into pocket parks. This, there are great ways that would also beautify a neighborhood and improve, improve property values at the same time. All of these are fantastic things that can be done. Similarly, we can use those lots or elsewhere through programs to encourage urban farming. Urban farming beautifies a neighborhood, it absorbs pollutants, and it reduces the frequency of food deserts. Um, and this would have to be coupled because of the high lead in our soil with some education and materials to help people make sure that what they are planting and eating is not poisoning them with lead. These problems compound each other over and over, so we have to be very mindful in what we do. Um, engaging in greening efforts, not only would it improve air quality and reduce asthma, it would reduce the urban heat island effect, thereby reducing energy costs in the summer. It would stem the spread of vacancy by improving uh, community morale and improving property values. It would reduce illegal dumping. People, people, people do not dump on pretty areas, at least statistically less likely to dump on pretty areas. And like I said, it would reduce helps with food deserts. Saying with food deserts, I'd like to see uh, grocery stores are of course businesses and they are an industry that often operates on a very narrow profit, profit margin. That means in high vacancy, low income areas, uh, a lot of food stores are unable to thrive and they shudder creating food, food deserts. 
Um, community owned grocers are a fantastic way that allows citizens to take control over their own health, support resources to help neighborhoods create community owned grocers, maybe coupled with some urban farming could really provide a healthy way for communities to provide for themselves where the commercial businesses have not. But with respect to commercial businesses, some tax deduction or some tax incentives to commercial grocers to make um, opening up stores in areas that are currently food deserts more viable will be great. Because right now our tax credits or our tax incentives are being used to build Whole Foods in the Central West End, which for those people that don't live here is one of the wealthier majority white neighborhoods in the city. Um, that not only improving access to food not only targets food deserts, but it also makes neighborhoods more livable, which then would hopefully stem the expansion of vacancy. Moving to our next topic um, and our last topic that I'm going to address, and that is lead exposure. Um, as we all know, there's no safe level of lead. Lead is uh, especially problematic for children. It, leads, it can lead to permanent reductions in IQ. It can lead to permanent behavioral uh, changes, including aggression, particularly with domestic violence. Lead exposure is bad. It happens to children. People don't know they're harmed until much later. Um, I want to talk about fences in St. Louis. And I really want everyone to listen because this is low-hanging fruit where there can and needs to be changed. Testing shows that most, if not all, of the fencing surrounding St. Louis's public schools is covered in chipping lead paint. Our schools are surrounded by chipping lead paint. So it's in the soil, it's on the fences. And I'm not talking about huge schools with beautiful playgrounds and all this area for kids to play on. These are schools, a lot of them, that have a blacktop with a jungle gym on top of it. The fence is essentially part of the play area. Kids are climbing on them. They are playing on them. They're hanging the hoods of their jackets on them and then putting their hoods over their faces. And in some of our elementary schools, I'm sure the kids are chewing on them. News reports suggest it would cost the city only $2 million to replace all of the chain link fences surrounding our schools. This knowledge is years old. The fences are still there. Low hanging fruit. We need to eliminate the chain link fences, replace it around our schools. I didn't realize it was the chain link fences. I thought the chain link fences had replaced like the painted iron fences. Is the chain link fences? I, I'm calling them chain link. Are they painted they're, iron? They're painted oh, they're iron and they have signs on them. Yeah. And some schools have both. Some yeah. schools have chain link that doesn't have lead and the wrought iron that is painted. Sorry. Okay, thank you for my mistake. Um, the school I went to, it looked like a chain link fence and they had a sign on it. It was a painted chain link fence oh. and it said caution lead paint. Well, and, ours and the sign was facing away from the playground. Right. And ours has that on a chain link fence, but I think it might be because the soil, they, they removed the um, iron painted fences, but they didn't abate the soil. Mm -hmm. So it's still like, don't play around the fence, but it's a exactly like you're saying, it's a small playground. So it's like everywhere is near the fence. <laughs> so there are a lot of places where the fences. You're lucky then. There are a lot of places where those fences are still there. Um, this needs to change. This is unacceptable. We can't poison our kids' brains when they are at school. That is the most disgusting level of irony. And the, what they leave out is the, the lead that is contracted at a young age can often lead them to be um, aggressive, mental disabilities, learning disabilities, and also through the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, but still focusing on schools, um, the state recently passed a law mandating water testing in schools and remediation. It is wonderful. I am so happy. Don't always say that about our legislature, but yay, Missouri. But water does not, uh, water testing does not 
does not look to all of the vectors of lead poisoning in our school. I'd like to see these laws expanded to require testing of soil, to require testing of paint, to require testing of playground equipment and similar remediation requirements. No more poisoning our children at school. Blood lead testing. St. Louis has a makes available for everyone free blood lead testing for children six and under. Again, yay, this is a wonderful, wonderful program. But a lot of people aren't aware of it. And I see that someone here wasn't aware of it. And it's only available Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. <laughs> this makes it inaccessible for a lot of working parents. There are easy ways to make this program more beneficial. Expand the hours, set some weekend days once a month or something. Make it available in pediatricians' offices for free mm -hmm. so that people can get it at their annual checkups. Expand this so that it has the effect that is intended. Um, and the last topic, topic I want to talk about is water filters. One of the main sources for lead is through our pipes. I think we all know old pipes were lead. It is difficult to replace lead pipes. What it is not difficult is to filter out lead using water filters. This is something that a lot of people do not know about. And for people who are living in poverty, purchasing water filters may not be an option. This again is low hanging fruit. Share information and get water filters who, to people that don't have the ability to pay for it themselves. All of these issues will reduce the school to prison pipeline and stop poisoning our kids before they're even out of diapers. So those are generally the topics that I discussed. What I have up here are a bunch of dots. I'll spread the piece right I can just, I'll just. What I'd like you to do is go over to those and put, these are the same as the slides that I showed you up there. Put dots on however many you want on the topics you think would be most beneficial to addressing these issues. And, oh shoot, we only have 15 minutes. I talked way too long. Okay, change of plans. Still put the dots on the topics that you think are most beneficial. Um, so I know what you all think. And then let's have an open discussion on these issues. What I would like you all to do is anything that you can think of, any ideas that you have, anything that we don't get to today. Um, I, there's notebooks. Pass those papers around your, your uh, table. That's the word I'm looking for. Pass those papers around your table and write down ideas. If you think there are unintended consequences that, I, that we should be aware of and take them into account, write that down. If you think of people that would be great or organizations that would be great of making these a reality, write it down. If you think there are any recommendations, anything you think that would help reduce these issues, that would help eliminate these disparities and help make life more livable for folks in St. Louis, I would love to hear it. So go ahead, grab the dots. And if you could go and put the dots up there, because I want to know what you all think is most important. I'm going to use that to help prioritize. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're missing something too. Yes, if, if there's an idea we didn't say, tell us. I have like well, There was a bunch of all I don't it's related. Yeah, no, I and there was like all babies were also. Like, don't do this. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. We have yeah. to be like, hey, yeah. 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 Yeah.
I don't know. It's gas. So try to um, and open the door. Yeah. Open the door. Yeah. Open the door. 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 Open the door
it was just pinch more than the you. Because I had one at Wilkinson and one at Plants, and then I was so we were just going to do it. But I really loved it. And I actually got kind of good in the dark with every for a while. So, my goodness, because your father, son, right? Oh, yeah. Your child? Yeah, my child. Yeah, because a lot of people are like, these are all the That is a wonderful. Anyway, so your old son, my husband, I think this would be very interesting. Like, my husband, I can't get more to the one who is the same class center. Yeah, I've never even gotten it. Yeah, I it's a parent group? No? I don't know about that. 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 Yeah. Is it just for the kids or for the kids? Oh, God. You're like, oh, you're even here now. Yeah. But anyway, I didn't know. No, not at all. I also, I was writing down in the It's not a therapy. I don't know. No, I was talking at least like in a state of kids. Yeah, so transparent is similar. It's actually with top nutrition though. Um, and we've gone a couple times, but um, the play group only starts, I think it's like 5 through 15. So we haven't been able to like, bring it on to be like a part of that experience, but we just went a couple times. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'll talk to other parents. It's really helped in terms of like the things that we might not have thought of. We have a in mind when it's like our kids getting older. Um, and so I'm I'm actually planning to start going again. I saw fire to smash this year. Uh, uh, the spring. Right, smash is pretty fine in April. I had fun. I had fun. I really like it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
We're never going to properly tackle climate change and environmental issues until we look at environmental justice. Because the way the world is set up now, rich folks create the pollution and then live someplace where they don't feel it, they don't see it. They will comp continue creating that pollution and not caring about environmental issues. I'm talking generally, not person by person, of course, until everyone feels it equally. So we, if we want to make substantial change, if we want people to change the environment for the better, to attack climate change, to make our planet livable long term, environmental justice is a critical part of that. Even if, it, even if you don't feel those initial heartstring issues, just generally from the disparities, which hopefully we all do because the disparities are awful and they're wrong and they should not exist. Just from a self-serving point of view, we're not going to deal with this until everyone deals with it equally. So these disparities should not exist. And if they are not remedied, we are all going to suffer. High horse, sorry. <laughs> a great high horse. <laughs> That's it. Any other questions? Anyone want to say anything? I have you all for three more minutes. What do you want to put contact information? Just, just on those sheets. I'll gather them before I leave. Right. In the chat, um, how did you come up with these specific recommendations? Is there data about these solutions being successful in other cities with similar issues? So we came up with the recommendations by first we looked at what was the law that we were living with. What is the law in St. Louis? Um, then we looked at cities, states, countries that have successfully tackled these issues, that have had them, dealt with them, and either reduced disparities or in some cases eliminated them. And then we saw what were those areas comparable to St. Louis. So what a city like New York can accomplish with its resources is significantly different from what a city like St. Louis can accomplish. We put all that information together and then we developed recommendations that we thought would be effective, were proven effective and feasible to accomplish given the circumstances that we all live in. And what was the second half to that question? Um, I forgot one thing. Okay. <laughs> um, I think it was just, how, has it worked in other cities? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so, I mean, some of our recommendations, like expanding LIWOP and, and, and LIHEAP, that's not something that has been done because, well, it needs to be expanded. But, um... Yes, for a vast, for a large number of these recommendations, they have been implemented elsewhere and they were successful. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you so much for your time and please do reach out to us. We love collaboration. Thank you.